In part two of this very short series on William of Ockham, I'm going to briefly explore his ethics. And in order to do that, we want to think about the will, the role that the will plays. So he has an idea that the intellect is separate from the will, and he emphasizes the will over the intellect. The, the will is the loci, or loci if you're a Latin scholar, uh, of freedom, and that's where you should evaluate morality. It's the will that promotes the actions, that brings about the actions. And so that should be your focus when you're evaluating an action. And Occam reasons that we can't prove that we have free will. Uh, so he doesn't enter into that debate about why I think we don't have free will and how to respond to those concerns. Instead, he just says, look, we can experience free will. And that is sufficient for believing that we have free will. So when it comes to morality, Occam is focusing on divine commands. In ethics, he's emphasizing divine commands over any other source of being able to evaluate what's morally right or wrong. So what is done due to it being commanded by God is then morally virtuous. That's how we identify what is morally virtuous if it's done because it was commanded by God. And then he has the highest virtuous action and that would be loving God. So loving God above all else is the primary obligation that all of us have. Now, we're not going to dwell on that, but let's go into looking at his moral assessment a little bit more closely. And for Occam, motives play a significant role. In fact, the same action could be vicious or of no moral value, you know, kind of neutral or virtuous, depending on the motive for the action. So in this sense, he's similar to Immanuel Kant, who emphasizes motives, but in other ways, he's, he's not. He's definitely not a person we'd call Kantian, let alone the fact that he came before Kant. Uh, so, for example, giving to charity, when you have the motive to help others, that's a virtuous act. If that's your reason for giving to a charity, uh, then that would be a virtuous action. But if you're giving to a charity in order to be honored and in order to be considered generous, well, that's a vicious act. That's, that's not truly honorable, and it's not something that is morally virtuous. And virtues also come in degree. So there are degrees of virtue. So some virtuous actions can be even more virtuous when done from proper motives. So some things that are just on a neutral scale would be virtuous, considered virtuous, the right thing. If you have the proper motive to do it, it's all the more virtuous. So for example, to study is a virtuous action according to Occam. It has value in itself, but, and it's generally, generally good. Um, but if the intellect, say, the person's intellect um, dictates that the action of studying should be done and continued, say, and the will wills that we continue to study, uh, then that's due to the right reason, and the act is all the more virtuous. So you have these degrees of virtue, according to Occam. Occam has some unique ideas. For example, Occam claims that God could have commanded other than what he did. And so this would have some very odd implications. But his motive is the idea that, look, God's not bound by anything. God is utterly supreme. So whatever God would command would have to be good. So it seems, if you're following this train of thought, and God could have commanded other than what he did command, God could have commanded someone to murder. And then uh, that person would be obligated to commit murder. Now, I am not going to try to chase down exactly uh, 
uh, the pros and cons or rather the um, details of how Occam might avoid this or if he's fully committed to this idea. It seems that Occam does claim this, but there are scholars who say that this is uh, too hasty of a conclusion and that Occam does provide a, a, a way around this seemingly paradoxical implication that you could have God commanding murder and so making murder good. Uh, but I am not in a position to be able to explain how Occam might do that. So I'm not going to try it. But I can go on to talk about God and causation. It's pretty clear that Occam says that God immediately causes every action, everything that is done, God is sustaining the universe, the world, the individual. And so it's God causing the action. So God can even immediately cause murder when murder occurs. Now, it's still the case, according to Occam, that the person who murders sins because that person is willed to murder and that person has disobeyed God. Uh, and so uh, there's no uh, presumption here that, that murder would be okay, like we, we said earlier. Um, and there's still the baseline idea that if you're disobeying God, you've done something wrong. But God has not sinned, according to Occam, in that situation, even though it's technically true to say God caused the murder, um, God's not the one sinning. It's the person that's sinning. It's the person that's willing to murder. Um, and God is under obligation to no one. So just because of that, it's actually impossible for God to have sinned or do anything morally wrong. Now, this idea is developed in different ways. Um, Descartes takes it one direction, for example. Um, this idea of God immediately causing every action is, is a theme that gets addressed um, in, later in, in modern philosophy. And other influences of Occam in, on his uh, people, the, the people who come after him, Occam's a predecessor of British empiricism. So fairly closely associated with Hobbes, the, the gap in dates and time between Occam and Hobbes is not that great. Um, and uh, of course, they're both writing in English. So uh, the Hobbes is uh, more closely affiliated with the ideas of Occam in those two senses. But it's clear that Hobbes is following along with some of that influence that Occam presents. Uh, maybe Locke much later um, is also, you could see some influences of Occam there. And broadly speaking for British empiricism, although I already mentioned Descartes having uh, some ideas that are similar to Occam. Uh, and of course, Descartes, not a British empiricist, but a rationalist and French at that. 